Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for everyone for being with us um, just throughout this entire uh, uh, webinar series from Monday to Tuesday to today. Um, we're so excited for you just taking your time being with us for One Generation's Health and Wellness Webinar Week. Um, my name is Miambi Cooper, and I'm the director of One Generation Senior Enrichment Center, and we're led by our organization's president and CEO, Jenna Haas. Um, so this webinar layout will be composed of having our presentation at the beginning, um, and then we'll have our questions and answers at the end. But please feel free throughout the entire presentation to use the chat function at the bottom part of your screen. You just tap that chat bu that button and you can type in your message or your comment. Um, and we also have a Q&A section at the bottom part of your screen where you can tap that and ask a question anonymous anonymously if you would like. Um, and we also have um, a section down there at the bottom of your screen that says raise your hand and that way you can ask a question verbally so if you do not feel comfortable using the chat um you can just type that raise your hand button and we can ask a question uh verbally um so this presentation is being recorded so and that just simply means that we are able to um, provide this video to you uh, later so that you're able to watch it over and over again and you're able to share it with your friends and your family um so in order to access this newsletter if you do not already have um if you're not already receiving our newsletter, um, you can go onto our website at onegeneration.org and you can just look in the, the newsletter tab and you can just input your email and hit submit and then that way you'll start receiving our newsletters on a regular basis. Um, and if that does not work for you, of course, you can give our office a call at any time. Um, our number is 818-705-2345. So I'm super excited uh, just to introduce to you Estella Robinson. Uh, she's a supervisor of marketing and Dr. Nasatko from Optum. So um, today, Dr. Nasako will be presenting on strokes and symptoms and prevention. So I'm super, super excited uh, just to have both of you here today. Um, Optum is always just an amazing partner with One Generation. So um, I would love to just go ahead and just jump in and please take over. Sure, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself briefly before I pass it off to Dr. Nishatko. Um, Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we were actually there on Saturday at the Senior Symposium at the park, so I may have seen some of you guys there, and it was just really great to be back out in person on a nice sunny day and um, be able to interact with you guys again, since I know it's been a while since we've been able to do the dances and the doc talks in person. But again, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, we have a nice presentation for you. Uh, Dr. Nishako is going to be going over strokes, symptoms, and prevention. And just so you guys know, we are Optum Medical Group. We are formerly Healthcare Partners Medical Group. You guys may be from, more familiar with that name. And we are all throughout the San Fernando Valley. Uh, we have nine different locations all across the San Fernando Valley going up also to the Santa Clarita Valley. And Dr. Nishako practices at our Northridge clinic and it is located right across the street from Dignity Northridge Hospital on the corner of Roscoe and Reseda Boulevard. Uh, we have two primary care physicians there. Um, we also have specialty there as well. I believe endocrinology, uh, neurology, um, and quite a few others, um, ologies that I probably can't even pronounce, but we are definitely here for all of your primary care needs, your specialty needs. And if you are looking for a new primary care doctor, please make note of Dr. Nishako's information here on the slide or um, you can call that phone number as well, or reach out to your broker. We work with many brokers and health plan partners that you may have met, th met this past Saturday that can also help you with selecting a primary care doctor. And again, we're just really happy to be here and to be able to provide this education for you guys. And um, please, at the end, make sure you guys ask some questions. We really want to engage with you. So um, looking forward to it. And I will go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Nishatko. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the introduction. My name is Dr. Nishadko, and I am a family medicine doctor. I work in Northridge at Optum, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about strokes. So what is a stroke? It's called a cerebral infarction. That's the medical term for it, or a CVA. It's a life-threatening condition, and it's marked by a sudden disruption in the blood supply to the brain. So when we're not getting blood to the brain, um, any kind of disruption in the blood supply starves the brain of oxygen-rich blood and causes the nerve cells in that area to become damaged and therefore die within minutes. So the body parts controlled by that part of the brain, they lose 
the ability to function. And that's where the different symptoms will come from. So there's two different kinds of strokes, really two main types. 80% of them are called thrombotic strokes, also known as ischemic strokes. And that occurs when a blood clot um, blocks a cerebral artery. And then there's a hemorrhagic stroke, which is about 20% of strokes. And that occurs when a blood vessel ruptures within the brain. Here we've got some statistics. So an estimated 700,000 Americans had a stroke last year, but few ended up in the hospital with the equipment and expertise to accurately diagnose and treat a stroke. So strokes in general, they're the third leading cause of death in the country. They lag behind heart disease and cancer. They kill about 150,000 Americans a year, leaving many more permanently disabled. So those are really you know, large numbers. And they cost us a lot of money, 62.7 billion in direct and indirect costs to treat. And out of those strokes, about 70 to 80% of patients survive the stroke, so that's good. But the only unfortunate thing is a lot of these people do have symptoms that they have to live with long-term. Here we have a map of adults age 35 and up based on the county. In the dark red, you can see where the largest population of um, deaths occur from stroke. So this is just a nice chart that can tell us that mostly, you know, the red numbers are on the East Coast. This is just another graph of what I discussed, the two most common types of strokes, the hemorrhagic and the ischemic, also known as a thrombotic stroke. The severity of a stroke is determined by the area of the brain affected and the extent of the damage. So a lot of the times when patients have a stroke on the left side of the brain, they'll actually experience symptoms on the right and then vice versa. It's just the way it works with the blood supply and the symptoms that occur with a stroke. There's a lot of stroke symptoms. So here I'm just gonna name a few. Again, just because you're having one of these symptoms does not mean you're having a stroke, but it's just something to look out for and keep in mind um, and pay attention to closely if you do experience this. So there's tingling and weakness of the face or extremities. You could have visual impairment, loss or blurry vision, distorted speech. All of a sudden you may find yourself in, unable to communicate, confused, having an unsteady gait, feeling dizzy, having a headache, new onset, sometimes very severe, drooping on one side of the face or the mouth, drooling as a cause of that, and even paralysis of an extremity on either side of the body. So it's really important if you have any of these symptoms, especially if they're long lasting, you want to get immediate help. The longer the symptoms go untreated, then the damage continues to spread and that can result in long-term disability and death. So it's really important to keep an eye on those symptoms. Now treatment, this is a little complicated and it really you know, depends on your medical history and the type of stroke whether ischemic, thrombotic, you know, or hemorrhage. So if it's determined to be an ischemic stroke, you need to use something to dissolve the clot. Clot busting drugs really is what they're called. Um, for both types of strokes, whether hemorrhagic or ischemic, the main goal is for blood flow to be restored to the brain as quickly as possible, preferably within three hours. Hemorrhagic strokes, they're more difficult to treat. At this point, you know, it's a brain bleed pretty much, an aneurysm, sometimes what it's called. And surgery could be required, as well as medications um, to control your blood pressure, to bring the blood pressure down, um, and also to decrease swelling in the brain. Those could be needed as well. 
And a lot of the times the neurologists is, you know, your primary point of contact if something like this is happening. Now the good news is strokes are scary, but 80% of them can be prevented. Um, they can happen to anyone, but there are certain risk factors that can increase your chances of a stroke. So up to 80% of strokes can be prevented by working with you know, your healthcare clinician um, to reduce your personal risk factors. And for you just to recognize you know, if you're having stroke-like symptoms and get help as soon as possible. This is a graph with some of the controllable risk factors. There's a lot of them. So there's obesity, there's having high cholesterols, um, alcohol, you know, drinking too much, smoking in general, um, having depression, circulatory problems, diabetes, issues with the heart. These are all risk factors uh, for stroke. So like I said, you know, the number one way in 80% of strokes can be prevented. The number one way is your lifestyle. So it's what you eat and drink and how you exercise. And being overweight in general, it can lead to high blood pressure and heart disease and increase your risk of strokes. So these are important ways that you, know, you can prevent your risk factors. And unfortunately, there's some uncontrollable risk factors, being African-American, being a female, having um, certain blood clotting disorders and some artery disorders like fi fibromuscular dysplasia and then some anatomy disorders. So that things that you can be born with like patent foramen ovale, which is pretty much a hole in the heart and that can increase your risk for strokes. Okay, let's start with a big culprit, and that's hypertension. So it's really important to maintain good blood pressure control. And in general, around 120s to 130s over 80s is good. And you want to make sure you're checking your blood pressure, of course, at least once a year. Um, but I'm sure many people are going to the doctor much more often than that. So they're getting their blood pressure checked more often. If you do already have the diagnosis of high blood pressure, preferably you wanna be checking daily. You wanna write down your blood pressure numbers so that your clinician can take a look at them at every visit. And then also just keep your clinician informed. If all of a sudden your blood pressure is 140s over 90s, it's staying there long-term, just make sure that you know we're aware so we can help you treat it and then prevent complications down the line. atrial fibrillation. So this is an abnormal heartbeat and it increases the risk of stroke by 500%. So this is really important. If you're diagnosed with this, really important that you, know, you see the doctor and you're getting treated and you're taking the medications as prescribed. So atrial fibrillation, it can cause a clot to pull in the heart and it may form a clot that causes a stroke. So that's the importance of making sure you're on the right medications if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Smoking, we all know, is bad for you. If you smoke, you know, try to quit. There's a lot of help out there. There's patches, there's the gum, something called Chantix. Um, there's, you know, behavioral health therapy. There's a lot of different options for you. So the number one goal is just to quit smoking because smoking doubles the risk of stroke. It damages your blood vessels, causes artery clotting, it can raise your blood pressure. So in general, it's just not a good thing to be doing. Alcohol use, uh, it's also been linked to strokes in many studies. So it's recommended if you're a female, no more than one drink a day. If you're a male, no more than two, and preferably you know, not to drink at all. But if you do, just to limit your alcohol intake. And
Okay, so another important thing to note on your blood work, you know, everybody's getting their cholesterols checked at least every six months or so, maybe once a year. And it's important to keep an eye on those numbers because cholesterol, it's a fatty substance in the blood and it's made by your body and it comes from food. So this is another way that you can really help control it. Sometimes people have hereditary elevated cholesterol numbers, but uh, primarily it does have to do with what you're eating and taking in. And high cholesterol levels, they can clog your arteries and cause stroke. There's different types of cholesterols in your bloodstream. The LDL is what we call the bad cholesterol, the low density lipoprotein cholesterol. It can build up on the walls of your arteries and increase your chance of heart disease and stroke. Then there's the HDL, which we call the good cholesterol. It's the high density lipoprotein. And what it does is it protects your heart against disease by taking the bad LDL cholesterol out of your bloodstream and keeping it from building up in your arteries. Then another one is the triglyceride. These are fats carried into the blood from the food we eat. So any excess calories, alcohol, sugars, they're converted into triglycerides and stored in the fat cells. So these are the three main types of cholesterols in our blood that we have to keep an eye on. Diabetes, this is another risk factor. If you've got diabetes, many people do, you know, the, the best way is to be taking your medicines and make sure you're keeping a low carbohydrate diet, low sweet diet. You can get help, you know, from your doctor, the endocrinologist, there's also dietitians and health education experts that can help you to manage what you should be eating. And um, if you're taking insulin, how you should be taking it, when you should be taking it. So there's a lot of help out there to help prevent um, stroke from being caused from this condition of diabetes. And make sure if you do have diabetes that you're checking your glucose, your sugar levels regularly as directed by your doctor. Weight has to do with you know, how we exercise and our diet. Excess weight strains the circulatory system, our heart, our joints, our muscles, you know, everything. So exercising five times a week is really important if you're able to. Again, if you've got conditions that prevent you from doing so, severe heart disease, you know, don't do it. Just go ahead and base it off of what your clinician says. But if you're able to, 30 minutes a day, five times a week would be perfect, would be preferable to get your heart rate up. Make sure you're eating healthy, so the right servings of fruits and vegetables. And then also, since blood pressure is a big risk factor for stroke, you want to maintain low salt in the diet. That'll help level out your blood pressure numbers. And also, you just in general don't want too much salt in your diet. Circulatory problems. This all leads back to just having fat deposits that can block the arteries. And if those are clotted, the blood can't go to the brain and other organs. So it's important to make sure those conditions are treated. There's also blood disorders, sickle cell, having um, anemia, meaning you have low hemoglobin count that can also affect um, our bodies and potentially lead to strokes. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the transient ischemic attack. This is a TIA. A lot of us know this by a mini stroke. So a TIA is a temporary episode of stroke-like symptoms. It lasts less than one day usually, but, and it doesn't normally cause permanent damage. But the only thing to keep in mind, sometimes people that do have a lot of TIAs can cause an increase uh, risk for actual stroke and actual ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. So if you have these, you have to make sure you're managing your risk factors, your blood pressure, your sugars, your weight, um, and you wanna recognize and treat a TIA so you reduce the risk of having a stroke in the future. 
up to 40% of people who experience a TIA may have a stroke. So this is in general medical management. There's a lot of ways to treat it. Number one is prevention, which we went over. Uh, number two is taking your medications that are prescribed to you by your doctor. Um, don't smoke, um, limit your alcohol intake, exercise. Those are all important ways to help with stroke prevention. And that's it. So thank you for listening. And I hope this opens everybody's mind and um, helps you recognize the symptoms of stroke and help prevent it and live healthy lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor, um, for the presentation. Um, we will now open up the floor for questions that you may have for the doctor. Um, you can use the chat function um, at the bottom part of your screen, the Q&A box, uh, if you would like to ask a question anonymously. And we do also have a raise your hand function as well to where you can verbally ask the doctor a question.